And I have to say that I started looking down about 10 years ago. I spent 30 years working with trees and forests as most people. And then I realized that working on biological invasions, we found that the consequence, the victims, were on the ground. And then we started uh, studying, and I've changed my life completely to study the grasslands and the ground layer, but I'm a beginner. And I came here to provoke all these uh, senior ecologists studying grasslands, trying to organize the, the knowledge and the, I would say, the geography of grasslands in the neotropics. And the problem is, starts with these maps. We have this map, this, I took this from Wikipedia, where subtropical grasslands, savannas, and shrublands are, but there's no map for grasslands. If you find one, please send to me, because it's very difficult to, for these people working with remote sensing, those that make the maps, to see the images, the satellite images, and say these natural grasslands are different from the pasture. Especially in the Neotropics, all grasslands are in landscapes where you have forests around. Even in Campo Pasture, you can have just a few small patches, but you still can see forests around. So it's very, very difficult to say it's natural, it's not. And then they don't see the difference using satellite images. How can they see the difference between a pasture and a native grassland? And then I, I was invited to talk about the grasslands in the neotropics and drivers and distribution. And I said, wow, I had to study. And I spent some six months reading papers about grasslands in other regions of South America and Central America. And I said, oh, should I put paramus in this list? No, I decided to consider only uh, grasslands below the tree line. And some people here in Minas Gerais consider the Campos de Altitudes as paramus, but I, I don't like this way. And so it's about uh, vegetation with less than 5% tree cover as proposed by Ribeiro and Valde. Well, uh, that's the scenario. All our grasslands are in landscapes where the climate would, would support forest vegetation. So are they alternative stable states, these forests and these grasslands? But we s many people say, studies say that there are soil conditions constraining tree establishment and growth. The question is, why trees are not colonizing these grasslands? And there are some studies showing uh, impeded drainage, water logging, shallow soils, uh, extremely low nutrients availability. But if that's true, they are stable, but they are not alternative. If there, there is a, a, an environmental limiting factor for trees to establish, so they are not alternative. But in some situations, you have no environmental uh, limitation, but you have a disturbance regime that keeps grasslands as open ecosystems, or fire, or grazing, or floods, or frost. In these cases, they would be alternative, but not stable, because if you interrupt the disturbance regimes. They will switch to another state. Oh, with that in mind, I try to organize all we have in terms of grasslands in the neotropics in four major groups. And I'm here because I want you to tell me I'm wrong or I'm right. And then I go on or I give up. Uh, and these are the flooded grasslands, 
Amazonian grasslands, Cerrado grasslands, and Atlantic grasslands, and I'm going to talk about each of them. Who are the Amazonian grasslands? Are landscapes like these in Venezuela, in Llanos, Roraima, Brazil, Humaitá, in the Parque Nacional dos Campos Amazônicos. They are all in under seasonal climate with a dry season, but in flat, really flat conditions. In this park, we, we have 340,000 hectares, and the difference in altitude is 50 meters. 50 meters is nothing. It's like a table. Very high temperatures, high rainfall, more than two meters rainfall, 2,500 millimeters. But this is the major driver keeping these landscapes like this. And the soils, pay attention on these. They are really, really old. And they are all surrounded by the Amazon forest. Uh, what science has already demonstrated is soil chemical prop properties in these grasslands and the forests around is the same. No nutrients availability. And the vegetation, the composition of the vegetation that many people think it's a cerrado patch immer immersed in the Amazon forest, it's not. It's quite different. That's the landscape. We have gallery forests and we have the grasslands in the interflux. What happens there is there is a, a layer of laterite. There is uh, the rainwater. Imagine 200, two and a half meters of rain falling down, no slope, and this water accumulates and it infiltrates and so there is an impediment layer and it can saturate and you can have like, like this water above ground and then here it's broken this layer is broken and then you can have trees some people think as i thought these grasslands never burn they are in the middle of the amazon forest but they do. This is uh, Alessandra's postdoc, and he has published this paper recently. These brown areas have burned from 8 to 14 times in 16 years. So it burns frequently. Then we come to the second group that are the flooded grasslands. Who are they? Part of the Llanos in Venezuela and Colombia, Pantanal in Brazil, and the part of the Beni Savanna in Bolivia. And what, why are they different from the first ones? Because water here comes from outside, comes from the headwaters, and then a river just uh, spread huge amount of water bringing soil sediments. That's because the soils here are young compared to that one. And we have floods that can be one, two meters tall, tall or high. And what's the difference for, for trees if it's waterlogged or flooded? Almost nothing. But if we are talking about the ground layer, Waterlogged means these plants have the roots in saturated soil, but the leaves are outside. And in flat areas, the whole plant are underwater. And these are, can be surrounded by the savanna, the cerrado, or the Amazon forest. Um, they also have seasonal climate. Wow. And they were shaped by these cycles of drought and flood, because in the dry season, they are really dry. And they are pioneer grasslands. The species there are not those typical of old growth grasslands. They are pioneer uh, 
germinating every year again and surviving sometimes to the floods. Um, in the south, then we have a different climate. No dry season. No dry season. They have in the south here, there are uh, highland grasslands and there, are, there is the pampa. And they have a strong seasonality in temperature. They have frosts, they have, the summer is really hot. And these uh, patches, and then I go to Rio de Janeiro, Itatiaia, Sao Paulo with Curucutu, and all these patches of grasslands are surrounded by the Atlantic Forest. Uh, you know very well these ones, I'm, I think here, they are in high altitudes, sometimes in shallow and clay soils. Uh, they can have fire, but uh, some people don't believe that. I would like to listen to you. Cattle grazing, not always, and they have a temperate flora, even in tropical region. The, in the Pampa, that is in low altitudes, about 300 meters, soils are uh, deep and mostly sandy, and that's different. So it, it means even in, if they don't have a typical dry season, sometimes a, a water death, death can exist, and they have cattle grazing. And they say if it's, it's not forest because they have cattle grazing. This is study from people uh, led by Gerhard Overbeck and this Ilse Boldrini. They made, um, carry out a really nice study sampling 56 sites in different soils in the whole region. Uh, this map with their results is based on geological types, you know, and here soil types in the background. But to summarize their results, each, each circle is one of their sites. What they found is two major groups. Highland grasslands and pampa that they consider as two different types of grasslands. And then we come to the Cerrado. Cerrado is a mosaic uh, of different types of vegetation and different types of grasslands considering the drivers. All with a dry season in the winter. Then we have like Campo Rupestre, Campo Cerrado, Vereda, Campo de Murundus, I'm going to show you each of them. Campo Rupestre uh, that is in the mountain tops, in shallow soils, rock outcrops. Do you use this word around here, skeleton soils? I've heard that in Australia and I said, I have never listened to that. And then I asked some people from the UK that work on this and they say, yes, it, this term exists. It's about what you see in Campo Rupestre, where you don't have true soils. You have small stones here and there. Extremely nutrient poor, and sometimes they can be hyper seasonal because there are patches where the rain accumulates because of the uh, local topography, and then these patches can be hyper seasonal. Some images, people want to separate, uh, there is a proposal of considering different regions as floristic provinces separated. And I like this paper from Martinelli that tried to make it simple, uh, separating Campo Rupestre and Campo de Altitude uh, as two major groups. S he says, these are Cerrado Mountains, and these are Atlantic Forest Mountains. And that's the major difference. And this is my comfort zone. Everything I, I, I was talking about is grasslands that I'm not really familiar with. These are the ones where I've been working. Uh, Campo Sujo, Campo Cerrado, that actually I don't see difference in terms of composition, in terms of ecology, they are very similar. Uh, always very deep sandy, mostly sandy and well-drained soils. Nutrient poor, low pH, and uh, in uh, 
soft or gently undulating relief. And then come the lovely uh, wet grasslands that are Campo Úmido, Vereda, and Campo de Murundus. What's the difference here? Only the domination of these palms, and then the botanists say, Vereda and Campo Úmido are not the same. No matter if ecologically, they are precisely the same, because these ones have palms, they are called Vereda, but ecologically and all the rest of plants here and here are very similar. What are the Campo de Murundus? Campo de Murundus are actually termite mounds. No matter if uh, some ecologists uh, published a paper saying that actually they are the result of erosional processes. And then the mounds would be um, remaining from a previous relief and the, in between there was erosion carrying out the soil and definitely I don't believe that and some other people don't because they are regular. And that's the view. What we have is a wet grassland here and then the mounds and trees on top. Uh, what happens there is there is an impediment layer. And these in colors are uh, one hypothesis that I bring to you, I, I'm sharing with you, because I believe that the termites are able to break this layer and then the trees can have their roots going deep and can survive. But it's to be demonstrated. And here is uh, a small patch of the most common landscape in the core area of the Cerrado where we have dry grasslands, wet grasslands, and gallery forests, sometimes pit swamp forests. Um, and here we can see a huge mistake of Isemi view because you see these white lines here? They are roads or fire breaks because they think the wet grasslands shouldn't burn. How they function? I love them. Uh, the wet grasslands, the Vereda, Campo Úmido, or Campo de Murundus, are wetlands. All rain infiltrates in the interflues, and all along the year, this water comes to supply the streams and springs. And so that's why we have permanent rivers in this, uh, perennial rivers in the Cerrado. Well, you don't have to understand everything there. It's just to show that we have this, all these different types of grasslands, and we have these major drivers of these conditions that are the factors constraining tree colonization. And each type of grasslands can be influenced by different factors. And bringing this to the restoration world uh, before that, well, the conclusions about these types is climate is not the explanation for the existence of grasslands and forests. Soil chemistry is not as well. The hydrological regime is extremely important for most of these grassland types interacting with physical soil properties. And this interaction is poorly understood. With rare exceptions, neotropical grasslands depends, depend on disturbance to be maintained. And uh, I have to say that if we want to work with grassland restoration in this scenario, we must consider all these mechanisms behind the transition. And how does this work? If we don't have these factors keeping the ecosystem as a grassland, we can have the vegetation moving to another state, and this means they would be 
alternative stable states. But climate change and land use can move a grassland to the other state. Can you imagine what can happen with Pantanal, with hundreds of small dams upstream, changing completely the flood pulse? If we want to use this information for our grassland restoration, we must understand which are the drivers maintaining grassland as grassland locally. And we must know if this was not broken by degradation. For instance, if you have those uh, laterite layers, or sometimes it's just a clay layer um, making it a wet site, if you break this with um, machines to do agriculture, you will never have a, a grassland back. What is the natural disturbance that we want and we need to reestablish? Is there a potential for natural regeneration? If there is, why to do restoration? And if not, we have to consider all those factors to select species, to decide about techniques, and learn, understand how to avoid invasion. And that's all. And I want to bring my students here because they were the ones that moved me from trees and forests to grassland. Thank you.